Hey friends, this is Bernard from Jurassic Time with another installment in our continuing studies into all things Jurassic Park. I was privileged enough to speak at length with none other than the paleontologist Jack Horner. Dr. Horner is known for his studies on the Tyrannosaurus Rex, his work on the Chickensaurus Project, as well as his involvement as the paleontological advisor to the first five Jurassic Park films. He was kind enough to share with us his recollections from the films and his career. Dr. Horner, let me start by saying what a privilege it is to get to speak with you today. I kind of want to start at the beginning of your prolific career and discuss how things have changed and grown. Can you speak a little bit to how the field of paleontology was when you began your work in the years leading up to 1993, with Jurassic Park especially compared to now? Well, um, yeah, back in back before, well, you know, back in the late 70s through the 80s when I was, you know, doing a, a, a lion's share of, of the research that I did uh, on dinosaur behavior and so forth, uh, you know, there were, there were not very many people in the field. I mean, um, you know, that it was, uh, it was pretty sparse and, and more than that, it was, it was very lopsided toward men. I mean, it was most, mostly guys. Um, there were a few women, but not very many. Um, and, you know, the late seventies was the beginning of what, you know, what, what they, what a lot of people refer to as the dinosaur renaissance. When John Ostrom had presented his idea that the dinosaurs were, you know, had given rise to birds. And then when, when we found the nest of baby dinosaurs, you know, that, that helped seal that deal, right? I mean, John Ostrom had lots of uh, cool ideas, but he didn't have much evidence. And the baby dinosaurs, the uh, suggestion that they were cared for by the parents was, you know, really showed that they had bird-like characteristics. So, and of course, that's what Michael Crichton picked up on, right? I mean, that was to make his Alan Grant character was, you know, from Montana and, and he was studying dinosaur behavior. That sequence leading up to that, uh, to, to, you know, Michael Crichton's book is where, where paleo was at that time, right? I mean, there were a lot of people out there, you know, trying to find new dinosaurs. There were a lot of people out there uh, doing various types of research, mostly having to do with with describing new animals. And, and then, you know, the behavioral stuff sort of piled on top of that. And then, you know, Michael Crichton writes his book and, and Stephen snaps it up and turns it into the end. So that was 1993 when the movie came out, and and before that, I had I had maybe oh I had three maybe three students, three or four students before 1993. They're all guys, and about 1993, you know. We, I got literally a flood of applications to become a paleontologist, and it was about 50-50, guys and girls. So then, you know, I mean, it was at a point in time when I had 18 graduate students, which is way too many. It's just, you know, it's just not possible. It's not possible to, you know, to deal with that many students, but but I had them anyway because I I hated to turn them away. I mean, it, these were these were terrific students that that could have literally gone anywhere, and they were at state university. So so I I accepted them, and and most of them made it through. You know, working on the movie was was a lot of fun, but. You know, my job really was to make sure the dinosaurs were as accurate as they could be based on the science at the time, but also, you know, they had to conform with his idea of what dinosaurs should look like as well. I mean, plus, 
you know, we had a lot of constraints due to technology at the time. We had, we got computer graphics during the shooting. We started out with claymation. transformed to computer graphics along the way. things had to change there and then and then they had to be able to sew together this brand new technology of computer graphics with the puppets you know with Stan Winston's, with Stan Winston's big giant puppets and you know that's basically why we have all the rain scenes right because you know it, it was hard to sew the two together Yeah, yeah, you can kind of hide it that way. You use the rain elements or other elements, smoke, uh, blue lens filter, and it kind of makes the image look like it all is from one source, like it was all shot on film together. Yeah, yeah. and you know, it worked great. You know, it worked very well. So, you know, we, for the most part, got dinosaurs looking like dinosaurs. They weren't dragging their tails. And it was, it ended up still being a scary movie. That's what, what Steven wanted. And you know, it turned out pretty good. And like I say, it, it attracted a lot of students to the field. Yeah, I'll even say for me, that was one of the first things where like seeing the dinosaurs in the film and not just images in a book, it made dinosaurs and paleontology look so exciting. This is a field you could learn, something you could do and have as a career. Um, and seeing them in the film as a kid, it made me aware that there was this field of study that I had no idea about. And so I could absolutely see how that could inspire a lot of people. Having discussed how much it's changed since then, do you see that the field has continued to grow on that path? It has, yes. Uh, you know, we. Even even when we made the movie, we knew that dinosaurs, you know, that the meat-eating dinosaurs were probably feathered, and we knew that they should be more colorful. And that was a decision made mostly by by Stephen, at least color goes. Um, the the feather thing was just technology. We just didn't have the technology to do that. So, well, but but yes, you know, we're we're. You know, basically all of the students these days, right, they are the children of Jurassic Park, right? Really, I mean, you know, there's very few of us originals left, and, and everybody is is a product of, of the movie, and you know, and and you know, it's it. We we couldn't change the animals in the first five movies. We couldn't because they're all the same, you know, they're in, in the storyline, they're all the same animals. So we can't have a growing feathers all of a sudden. And, and so, you know, we, we had to maintain kind of that old look to them. Steven's TV program, Terra Nova, I advised on that as well. And we, we were able to make feathered dinosaurs there and make them colorful. So, you know, I mean, by that point in time, we could do it. Uh, but, and like I say, we could have done it in Jurassic Park, but it, you know, we had to follow the storyline. I hear in the new the new version of Jurassic World that they've got some feathered dinosaurs in it. So yeah, yeah. In the prologue to Dominion that just came out not too long ago, uh, we see the world as it was millions of years ago, and the T Rex has like proto feathers, and the Oviraptor has feathers, and I'm sure there's going to be a lot more too. This all says so much about your work, the longevity of it, that it brought so many students and brought new excitement and interest into the field. It almost becomes like a love letter to your work as well. 
you kind of mentioned it earlier, but with Crichton working on the novel, you're acknowledged for your research in it. And there seems to be some referential things to you, perhaps, in Alan Grant. Uh, did Crichton ever speak to you when he was working on the book, or was it more of a he'd seen your work and wanted to include that? Um, well, Michael, I, I, I didn't talk to Michael. The first time I met Michael was in the limousine on the way to the premiere. So. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, but but he did acknowledge, and, and he does in the book, um, that his character was a combination of he had he had just read my book and he had just read Bob Bacher's book on dinosaur heresies and he basically melded the two together to make a character. Right. And Stephen separated them, you know. So I am the Alan Grant character and Bob Bacher is the Robert Burke character in Lost World. So Stephen made a point of taking the two characters apart. So the film is geared more towards you with the character. Um, and then in the Lost World being referential to him as well. That's so interesting that the first time you met Crichton was in the limo on the way to the premiere. I know he was on set a lot of times. He was. was I, I, uh, I, you know, making a movie is, you know, it was fun. It was fun hanging out with Steven Spielberg, but quite frankly, you know, working in my lab is a lot more fun than working on a movie. So I, I only went there when I was needed and and uh, I, I could have spent a lot of time there if I wanted to, but but uh, I only went when they had the an big animatronic puppets on on stage, and, or or if they you know if they needed help with actors pronouncing their words right and all that. But for the most part, I I I would come and go pretty quickly. So with the discovery and the work at Egg Mountain in the '80s that really seemed to shake the foundations of dinosaur studies with the implication that dinosaurs could be nurturing, caring parents, which you spoke a little of as well, um, exhibiting colony behavior, theropods nesting nearby. But in recent years, has there been much continued work at Willow Creek or study into what secrets may still lie out there? Big Mountain site is, is you know, it's a world-class site and it's still, uh, the Museum of the Rockies owns it now and there's a field station there and yes uh my a lot of my a couple of my former doctoral students um actually continue to do research there david vericchio uh, who is a professor at montana state university now he he worked he continues work on egg on egg mountain proper which is the troodon nesting site and Holly Woodward, who is a professor at Oklahoma State, uh, she continues work with the Myasaura. And a number of other students come and go from out there. So yeah, no, that 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 site is very active. And also I'm hoping even this summer to get out to do a little bit more with some of the, the really tiny baby material. I mean, of course, a lot of that was your work. You've studied them and been able to document multiple life stages. Would you say that of the species that have been discovered, would you say the Myasaurus is one that we know the most about? Well, I, you know, we know an awful lot about Myasaura. There is no question about that. Um, but we, along the way, we found another dinosaur in the same formation, but about uh, 100 miles away um, in the northern Montana called Hypacrosaurus, and it was uh, a, a crested duckbill dinosaur. And we found its nesting ground and we got babies of it. We got embryos, we got eggs, we got, you know, we have a whole growth series of it. Um, we haven't found as many bones of Hypacrosaurus, but, but we, have, we have nearly as much information, but but quite clearly, Myasaura is the best known dinosaur in the world. We have, we have, we have its footprints. We have its feces. We have, we have uh, its skin impressions. We have, you know, embryo eggs, embryos, nests. I mean, you name it. I mean, we've got we've got everything you could almost imagine for worrying, you know. 
almost as, as if it were alive, right? I mean, we know an awful lot about it. And the only problem with it is we don't have very many good skeletons of it. I mean, um, you know, there's maybe, you know, two, two known skeleton, you know, pretty decent skeletons of the, of the animal. And most of the bones, I mean, we've got, we've got a bone bed where we have, we're, we're pretty sure we have somewhere around 125,000 individuals, but they're all apart. So the, there's just thousands of bones scattered around. So, so you can't, you know, you can't really tell which, you know, what set it makes up a real, you know, one individual. So, so, but like I say, we, you know, Myasaur is a dinosaur that we definitely know we have the most information for. That's amazing. I mean, I can imagine that's a huge source of pride for you. It's uh, something you've worked so closely on to have been able to document so much of the species and to be able to preserve it. Well, well it's, you know, it's definitely my favorite dinosaur. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, was it ever an animal that you tried to get into the films or get represented in any of the media that you worked on? Um, not, not really. Um, I, you know, when, when Steven is looking at, at putting a dinosaur in the movie, he wants something that, you know, is splashy. Right. 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 Um, you know, you either put, you know, you put T-Rex in there because that's the most famous dinosaur and you put Triceratops in there because that's the second most famous dinosaur. <laughs> yeah. And, and then you start looking at other dinosaurs and you figure out which ones have the coolest structures on their head, right? The coolest accoutrements. Myasaurus doesn't really have a cool, uh, yeah, I mean, you, you wouldn't, you'd have a hard time telling one Myasaura from any other, you know, nearly flat-headed duck Myasaurus. So. Yeah, I think it was the Edmontosaurus where they recently found one uh, that had a comb on its head but that's just a soft skin impression. So there could be a lot more of that, um, which until we find a well-preserved specimen, there's no way to know, but it's a good assumption. We know that they exist. In the artwork that I have done by other artists, I always have them make all kinds of soft tissue accoutrements. I mean, it makes sense. Like you said, relationship to birds and needing some sort of enticement in courting females. Our three-part interview with Jack Horner continues next week, where we discuss behind-the-scenes stories from the films, the Dino Chicken Project, and the role science plays in our everyday lives. Until then, we invite everyone to celebrate International Dinosaur Day by checking out Jack Horner's Dinosaurs website, where you can see a collection of the NFT paleo art Jack was discussing. We're also excited to help announce that Jack Horner's Dinosaurs Neotany NFT collection will drop on June 1st. Like the Origin collection before it, these art pieces will benefit research and education. Links are in the description. Thanks to everyone who made this interview possible, and we'll see you all next week here at Jurassic Time.